They called our generation the missing millions. Missing not because we went anywhere. There's nowhere left to go. Nowhere except the Oasis. Hey everyone, I'm Lucy. And I'm Tamor. And we are going to be giving you our spoiler-filled thoughts on Ready Player One. But if you haven't seen the movie, luckily we have a video for that put together by your girl Lucy. It me. Five reasons to watch Ready Player One because it might surprise you. We liked mm -hmm. it a lot. So subscribe to GameSpot Universe. While you're there, if you're a fan of Marvel, there's plenty of Infinity War videos there, including who we think will kill the big bad purple monster Thanos himself. And from one great movie crossover, to another, because we really, really enjoyed Ready Player One, and uh, we're going to give you our reasons why. Obviously, spoilers. We've already said that. Let's plug into the Oasis. Okay, so we both read the book, obviously, because mm -hmm. you couldn't be a nerd in 2012 onwards without having read that book. So the thing, the big thing about Ready Player One, the movie, is just how different it is to the book, and I think that's only to its a, benefit. To its benefit, because the book, I think. Maybe because of the way the medium was, you kind of have to list everything. Um, some people found that, I certainly found it quite obnoxious just having to read like a Wikipedia list of references. But in the film, obviously because of the medium, you can just show, not tell. Yeah, it's all about taking, and it also kind of expands on what the subject matter it mm. touches. The book was very much focused on video games. Yes, um, and particularly 80s, 80s video, video games. 80s video games, which even if you're like a video game fan growing up today, there's a high chance that, that you might not connect with that, any of that stuff. Mm. So uh, the movie actually kind of modernizes it and also opens the doors to just a whole different variety of nostalgia from yes. movies to comics to video games to music. Um, pretty much everything that you have a fondness for from you know 80s, 90s is represented mm. in some way. And there's modern video games in there as Tracer. well. Tracer. Tracer's in there. You've got Ryu from Street Fighter, for example. So it kind of like brings everything together and wraps it into a story that feels more about this hero's journey mm. instead of indulging fan nostalgia and kind of just having an incidental story just to so you can use it as a vehicle to go name, game name, game name, mm. game name, game name. So the thing I really liked is that they changed a lot of the story and they still, but they still kept obviously the nostalgia stuff that gives it a lot more weight, but they made it a lot more heartfelt. So uh, one of the very smart things they did was they brought the characters together in the real world mm. way sooner than they did in the book. I think it's like towards the very, very end that Wade actually even meets Artemis for the first time. Yeah. However, now they're together in the real world. And it was, just, it was a theme that I think that Spielberg tried to get across is that regardless of how amazing the Oasis is, it's your real human connections that are yeah. should be cherished and should be given more thought to. Yeah, so the, the story plays out in that way. It's it's like, it's it, it's very Spielbergian. It makes you feel good about the things you love, but it also gives you this message that's kind of like hopeful. At the end, it's like, if you love the Oasis, that's great. If you love video games or whatever it may be that your passion is, that's great. But try and remember that there are people around you as well who are equally deserving of your time and attention and you can find value in them as well. And the fact that it skips that and brings them, you know, together in a real world quicker means Skips that... Skips the weird stalking yeah, subplot. Yeah, you get, you get a lot of the awful, like the stuff that you read and you're like, yeah, this was written by a nerd, 100%. Like, it, that is all cut out mm. um, and you get a more... It's, it's still kind of like truncated, mm. their relationship. They go from zero to like, baby, I love you in like one minute. Oh, that made me minute. cringe, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, like that was the moment where I was like, oh my God, this is so bad. But still, it's more human than anything in that yeah. book. So yeah, it was worth it. If you're watching this, I'm dead. I created a hidden object, an Easter egg. The first person to find the egg will inherit half a trillion dollars and total control of the Oasis itself. So not only did they change the plot of the book, they also added, they made the characters a lot more three-dimensional, which I really loved. Like Mark Rylance's portrayal of Halliday. Halliday! Thank you. <laughs> Madonna. Uh, I thought Sorry. was incredibly nuanced and just very touching. Yeah. Ogden at the end, like Simon Pegg with the very strange Weird prosthesis. Thing. Yeah. But his moment at the end where he got really emotional and sort of was like on the verge of crying, I was like, Oh no, I didn't expect to feel feelings yeah, in yeah. Ready Player One. What is this? I think the it was weird, like you you see a lot of like human kind of struggles reflected mm. in Halliday and he just wanted to matter. 
and he just wanted to enjoy the things that he wanted. Mm -hmm. Like it was all about control and there's like a, a weird like business subplot to it yeah. where they're trying to figure out, you know, one cre a person trying to be the creator and always focus on what makes him happy and giving life to the things that he imagines and then there's his friend who's trying to be like but we want to make it successful we need to make these sacrifices we need to do these things so that kind of like pushes their relationship along but at the same time you kind of focus on him Halliday and you're like I can see myself in yeah. him like I a lot of people like they they just want to do something meaningful with their life right and like the fact that it is able to present that in a way that you're able to connect with Halliday is really really fascinating because you also see him doing it with things that you know and love. Yeah. It, like, it creates this really interesting kind of personal moment for you where you're like, yeah, I can relate to him. And he just wants to make things that I love more popular. And he just wants to enjoy himself with the things that I love. So you're like, you're all right, Halliday. Yeah, all right, I don't man. mind you, you're cool. And he's like, the way he's portrayed is really, really nice. Like there's some subtleties. There's, he's got this kind of aloof sadness. Yes. Where he's like kind of slouchy, but he's also kind of like looking around. You know he's a genius, but he's also a bit sad. Yeah. And you're like, oh, mate. You've the sacrifices right. he's made as well. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the baddie. So Sorrento, played by Ben Mendelsohn. Very Spielberg yeah. kind of baddie that you kind of rally around. But he's all, he's not without his um, like insecurities. I, yeah. I just thought he was very funny, very camp baddie. He's, they very cleverly created a personality type that fans of any sort of like medium, mm. like music, TV, games, books, comics, fans naturally hate yeah. and it's the fake fan. The fake fan and the man who wants to control your, the things you the love. Things yeah, you so love. it's like, what if we took the CEO of that video game company you hate with that guy who pretends he loves things every time it becomes popular, combined him into one and then made him put him in a really awful smarmy business look and like instantly I was like, I hate this guy. Yeah. He's the worst. And he'd been on the screen and he'd barely said anything. I was like, I know he's that that dude who's like, yeah, I love Batman. And you like uh, name one Batman comic and he can't do it. But his boys will come up and be like, long Halloween. And you're like, long Halloween. I did feel that his, uh, his like, like just, just the most generic, forgettable, generic, generic like ninja henchman. assassin lady. She was like, uh, I felt she was underused. She was in Black Mirror and I was like, oh, she's going to be in Ready Play One. And she was completely underused. Yeah, she was so underused. And it's annoying because like, they kind of acknowledge how under her, her plot is that she's underused. Mm. Like she just gets no respect, no like, and she's yeah. trying to make stuff happen for these bad. She's a bad character, but like, even the film doesn't give her much attention, and she knows with being in the film, like I'm just getting no love here. What's happening to me? Speaking of, uh, H gets a lot of screen time. Is very funny, but then there's Sho and Daito who are just there. Yeah. But, I mean, the one, the awesome Gundam moment. Yeah. Is incredible, but there are, I mean, other than Wade and um, Artemis, like the other heroes just don't feel. Yeah, H is H is like the comic relief. H and, is funny. I yeah, like H. very funny. Sho and Daito don't get a lot of love, but they still manage to be cool in the scenes that mm. they are in. Um, unfortunately, they play into very archetypal characters. Are oh, the two Asians are playing the ninja guy and the other anime dude? So it's like, okay, fair enough, um, but. When they do something, it's really cool. Welcome to the rebellion, Wade. And then there's Wade and Artemis. Wade is less a uh, Wikipedia list article than mm -hmm. he is in the book. Uh, still a little bit of that. He still is a little bit, yeah. but I thought he was, you know, he was a fun He's... protagonist. I like the relationship he had with Artemis. Yeah. The one thing that did get me though is that like Artemis's birthmark, it didn't look authentic. It just, it didn't look like they'd really committed to it. It was a very Hollywood birthmark, let's yeah. put it that way. Um, but other than that, I really liked their characters. I thought they were very sweet. However, the line where he tells her that he loves her. It made my Ooh, butt cheeks clench up. It was I, so no, awkward. And I was that like, was very, very awkward. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was heartfelt and it was adorable. It was young love. It, it, yeah, I think you can look at it as like, these kids are young. They've mm. kind of like, it's, it's that moment where you, it's like basically they met in the chat room and none of it makes sense and yeah. they are very, very much into it. So it seems like the kind of thing uh, an inexperienced bit of a doofus would do and be like, hey, I just met you and this is crazy, but here's my number. Call me maybe. Spielberg actually said a very interesting thing about how he was going to handle the references in Ready Player One. He said that like the main windshield, if you imagine it as a car, Ready Player One the movie as a car. It's a car, yeah. 
Uh, the main windshield is for the main story, and out the side windows you can see all the references and all the nostalgia. So they aren't integral to the main plot, but they are there. They're just something to be enjoyed, like a nice bit of scenery. Obviously Spielberg has never drifted, because if you drift, then you can see it all. Oh my God. Come around the corner. <laughs> Hit me up, Spielberg. I'll teach you how to drift. <laughs> I thought the references were quite well done. It did make me feel like, oh damn it, I need to see this again because I've missed like so much. And I felt like once I stopped trying to find all the references, it was just kind of pleasant to mm -hmm. see them. Uh, for the most part, they're just they're just sort of there yeah. in the world, like a save Ferris poster on the wall or something. Yeah. But then there are some absolute clangers, like when he was in H's workshop and Wade goes, oh my God, it's the Battlestar Galactica, or the blah, 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 blah. Yeah, there's a bit where they specifically call out Tetsuo's bike from Akira, which was like, yeah, we get it. You're, You're like Akira. Nerd. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, overall, I just quite liked it. Um, yeah. It's like very much, like Spielberg say, said, it's window dressing. Yeah. Um, and it was just enjoyable to like spot something on the, on the, off on the side and then go like, ah, uh, I know that, and then carry uh, on watching the movie. Um, and there's a lot of it's like hidden as well. There's mm. one se battle sequence where you get to see like the silhouette of a bunch of things. And you're like, that's the movie. That's the part I want to go back, and I yeah. wish I could freeze frame and be like, I know what that is, and figure it, figure it all out. Yeah. But for the most part, it's not in your face, and I respect that more. It's different from the book. Oh yeah. Way different from the book. What was your favorite reference? Uh, I'm gonna say the very final moment. I like. Oh, I know. Really? I, I know what your best. one is. Um, I know what your one is, but I'm saying it just so that we. I yeah. love that moment as well. But I, there's a moment towards the end where um, they summon a Gundam. And it's pretty. I I don't like Gundam as much as most people do. Like I, I enjoy the original Mobile Suit series and some bits here and there. But the the build up was perfectly anime. Like he sits mm. down, oh, yeah. um, and like he's out of the fight, and everyone's H is like, "Are you gonna get involved in this fight or not?" And when he said that, I knew that there was gonna be a summoning happening because he's just sitting there. And then at the very pivotal moment when they need him the most, like he jumps in and summons a Gundam and a Gundam comes into a fight, and it's it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Like, I got chills, and I was like, yes. I did, I didn't even like Gundam. Yeah, it was, it's perfect. But my favorite, so you'd already forewarned me that there was a thing about The Shining, and The Shining for me is kind of like sacred to me, and so I was kind of a bit nervous about that. And as soon as I heard the music, I was like, okay, brace yourself, brace yourself, brace yourself. When they went into the Overlook, and you're in, you know, the, the lounge, I guess you would mm. call it, where Jack is, throwing the ball against the wall and all work and no mm. time, make Jack a doll boy. Oh, I actually got chills. Yeah. And the way that it was handled, the twins, although one of they, them wasn't one of them wasn't taller yeah. than the other, so I was like, mm, come on, get that right. But I Sorry. mean, overall, it was like the way that they put Halliday in the staff photo at the end, the way that the carpet was the same, the music, the elevator, the elevator scene, room 237, Having yeah. the, the one thing that w I will say though is that like, this is a movie that's what a 12A? Yeah, kid. they had the lady. Well, not just that, it's like what kid these days is going to be watching The Shining and who will understand that entire section because it's but at the same time, it's like visually arresting enough that yeah. someone might look at that and be like, kid might look at that and be like, what is that? Yeah. And like try and hunt it down and figure out what that reference Kids, is. don't watch that movie. <laughs> watch that movie. I watched it back in the day on two VHS tapes and it was an incredible moment for me. So overall, I just thought the the homage to The Shining and the homages to a lot of things were just mm. very, very well done. And big ups to the licensing people because, oh my God, I don't think they will have slept for like the last five years. Yeah. And there's a bit where he does a Hadouken and it's not a great range to do a Hadouken. If you're up close, you want to try and go for an overhead, not a Hadouken. So Ready Player One also happens to be a visual feast for the eyes. Feast. A feast. I really liked the way it looked. I did. I was concerned mm -hmm. because when you have characters like that uh avatars motion capture facial yeah. capture all that kind of stuff i was like "Ooh, is this gonna be a bit uncanny valley but it wasn't because they injected so much personality into these characters yeah. that it was just actually just really good to look at at times like the character models do look a bit odd and like they seem just exa over exaggerated just enough that mm. they but it makes sense because it Artemis, looks because she's quite yeah she's very elfin. sharp yeah so like and even like wade looks a bit odd in some of his like iterations when he's wearing certain costumes but i think that works for it because it kind of creates this distinct visual identity mm. it's in the same way that you look at something like world of warcraft and when that first came out it's a beautiful game but if you look at it now it still it looks a bit odd like mm. just in bits very like, stylized yeah you can tell it's a video game mm. and like we're at a stage where we can fake 
worlds and people in a very convincing manner. And Insert fact, Andy Circus yeah, video here. Like, the fact that they went away from it and just did it just a bit like so on the caricature side really helps it. It creates the visual identity it needs and it you feel like you're watching a real MMO than if it was like really cool high-end graphics. And it helps all the weird disparate worlds come together yeah. in an interesting way. Um, it's a lot of visual variety and like it's one of those movies that is really interesting to look at and kind of enjoyable like if you're even if you're not understanding mm. what's happening you can just look at it and be like this is this is good this is a feast for my eyes feast a veritable smorgasbord <sighs> but no i really enjoyed seeing it on the big screen because i coming out of it i was like i want to see it in imax yeah. i want to see it on the biggest screen possible and i've never thought that about a film mm. apart from top gun we watched top gun and you do not want to see tom cruise's tongue that close to your in eyeballs IMAX. but no That's i mean like I, i've never come out of a film and thought I wish I'd seen it in IMAX. Yeah. Now we've been very positive about Ready Player One. Mm -hmm. We both did really enjoy it. Obviously, the film is not perfect. You do. I feel like you have to go into it with a more of an open mind, yeah. and you have to kind of peel back your nerd layers and not get on your high horse about stuff in yeah. order to really fully don't, just enjoy it for what it yeah, is. Don't gatekeep. Don't gatekeep. But uh, some of the things in it that kind of mm, I didn't really like inconsistencies with the logic around the oasis mm -hmm. and this is I mean this is a very specific a nerdy very game video person. game thing but it's like your world is only as believable as the rules that mm. you assign to it basically and the same that obviously goes for video game logic same goes for the oasis so in the oasis it there are, there are no consistent rules about where you can be attacked which is mm. very different to the book because there were definitely safe zones safe zones like, like schools and stuff uh, and also, the the Oasis has been around for like, what, 10 years? And there is no way to keep your stuff safe. Like everything you are carrying at one point, can, you can lose. So Resident Evil had that in the first game. Put it in the trunk. Put it in the damn trunk. It's got a teleporter to every other trunk in the world. Magic trunk. But no, I mean, so that kind of thing, like from a video game perspective, especially given how heavily they are leaning on video game logic, yeah. annoyed me. Yeah. And that might be nitpicking, but I didn't. Devil's know. Advocate, like it's something that also annoyed me, but I guess the thinking is video game rules are complicated. It gives video, jeopardy. Yeah, video game rules for MMOs are even more complicated. And what is the value in really explaining all that nitty gritty stuff when you just want to have this like easy breezy action sci fi romp? Yeah. Um, so we understand that is the conceit. But and it adds it's, peril. Yeah, it still annoyed me as well, kind of. I was like, if I was reviewing this as a game, that would get a 5 out of 10. Uh, and we touched on this earlier, but uh, underdeveloped characters. Mm. I think what annoyed me about it as well is because, like, Sho and Daito got their own posters. Yeah. I was like, what? You are barely in it. Yeah. You did nothing. Like, you, you had, like, one line about being a cool 11-year-old. I mean, yeah. yeah. It did annoy me. Uh, and... H is more meaningful. H is great. H deserved yeah. uh, a character poster. Yeah. Artemis and, obviously, Wade are the main characters, but... And... The villains, there's a few like weird side lady villains she's not used much, but she does have a great moment right at the end where she finally has enough and just yeah. like, shut up, you little pest, and um, slaps her into. Also, the uh, aunt, or should I say, mother's sister. This kind of rolls into my next point about the dialogue. Weird. Some of it was, sounded like it was written by someone who'd never heard anyone speak before. Yeah. Uh, referring to your aunt as, Mothers. You killed my mother's sister? Like, no one would do that. Yeah. Uh, also, the the partner. The weird guy, yeah, he's... Finchy. Yeah, the... He was just there for a bit, was a bit of a dick. Yeah, I think he's like he's obviously there just to make you feel sympathy for Wade, but like... Yeah. I was like, who is this guy? Like, he looks like pencil thin, just punch him in the nose and be done with it. Um, but no, I mean, the, going back to the dialogue, you killed my mother's sister was one that stuck out to me. I, the I love you really stuck out. Um, the worst one for me was... A fanboy knows a hater when they see one. I've watched all of her Twitch streams. Oh, what was it? He said something very strange yeah. about Twitch. Like yeah, it's a very watching. specific name drop, and it just didn't. Oh, it didn't work. Yeah. Um, but yeah. again, it's just nitpicking. Another thing that really like the the bit where they're talking and he's like, "I love you." That was like, oh. The other thing that really made my skin crawl is the way he touched her hair. As Ooh, he was touching yeah. the scar, I was like, oh, that was real <laughs> weird. Like, even like, if you watch it back, you can see for a moment, even she's like, mm, the fuck's going um, But other than that, I mean, it's just a fun Spielberg romp that overall I really enjoyed. 
and I'm going to see it again. So, and I never do that about films. Don't have time. Yeah, it's fun, 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 fun. Good movie, go see. Watch. So there we are, that's what we thought of Ready Player One. Yep, and I'm excited to learn what everyone else thinks. Mm. I've read some of it, but you know, I wanna see more in-depth analysis. Tell me what you loved. Tell me what you hated. Tell me what surprised you. Tell us. We're excited to hear about it. While you're here, don't forget to subscribe to GameSpot Universe. We've got plenty of content. If you like Marvel especially, plenty of videos for you. So hit that subscribe button. In the meantime, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at Tamor H. I'm at Lucy James Games, and we'll see you next time. Peace out.